Right, the witching hour has arrived. Welcome to the Geological Society and to this the ninth Shell London Lecture for 2013 entitled Shear Water Geology Under Pressure. Now my script has a number of alliterative phrases so if I stumble please forgive but I'll try not to. My name is Edmund Nicholas. Well, for making this series of public lectures, the UK Central North Sea consists of high pressure, high temperature plays HPHT. And the Shearwater Platform provides a key example of this challenging oil habitat in the heart of the province. To explore these challenges today, we welcome Caroline Gill, a senior geologist working as Near Field Exploration Coordinator for Shell in the HPHT area of the Central North Sea. She has a first class degree in geology from the University of Cambridge and a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, where she undertook industry sponsored research on the structural evolution of the Northern North Sea. Before joining Shell in 2005, Caroline completed A qualified leader and keen skier, canoeist, sea kayaker, climber, and walker. In 2009, Caroline was awarded the Oil and Gas UK Overall Excellence Award, and in 2012, the Professional Woman of the Future Award, recognizing her early career contribution to the industry and her investment in the future through technical coaching and mentoring of younger staff. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Caroline Gill. Thank you very much, Eden, for that kind introduction. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start this evening by extending my thanks to the Geological Society for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening and to thank you all for making the effort to come. I have to admit that I was somewhat surprised to learn that a lecture on geology was so oversubscribed. <laughs> geology is traditionally the preserve of old with big white beards who look at dirt and wave their arms about a lot. I, I hope that over the next hour I can share my enthusiasm for geology as a not old man with a big white beard and show you a place in the world where understanding geology really matters, not just to extract hydrocarbons, but also to ensure the safety of the many men and women that work on the infrastructure that sits above the geology. Before I go any further, there are people standing at the back. There's plenty of seats at the front if you want them. So I want to introduce you to a small bird. Shearwaters are medium to long-winged seabirds. They're very long-lived, and there's more than 30 species of shearwater in the world, and they live in temperate and cold waters. The shearwater field is named after these birds, and after seabirds. I have a particularly soft spot for shearwaters, they live at sea, and they only come onshore to breed. They try and choose moonless nights to avoid predation. 
I had the privilege of seeing Manx shearwaters come ashore on Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel many years ago, and I consider it a similar privilege to have been responsible for geology on the shearwater field. Shearwater is not geology for beginners. It's complex and it's difficult, but it's also fascinating. And I can hope I can keep your interest over the next hour to share my enthusiasm to explain what the shearwater field is and how Shell are successfully working to understand it. So before I go any further, I'm obliged to show you this slide. <laughs> so now you've all read it, we'll carry on. So to outline what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start with some introductions. I'll introduce you to the shearwater field itself, a bit of an introduction to the subsurface, but also an introduction to the facilities. I'll introduce you to this high pressure, high temperature province. I'll define it and explain what it is and what are the challenges associated with working in it. I'll introduce you to the North Sea and then we'll zoom in to the shearwater field. First the structure of the shearwater field and then the reservoirs. And because geologists like to go from the bottom up, I'll start at the bottom and we'll step through the reservoirs, looking at the character of the rocks and the hydrocarbon potential associated with each of those reservoirs. I'll then show you three examples of how technology is unlocking those reservoirs. First of all, I'll show you how we've used 4D seismic. I'll then talk about geomechanical modelling, before then touching on how our drillers uh, are getting us back into these reservoirs uh, in, in the challenging environment. And I'll finish with some conclusions and acknowledgements. The, uh, the photograph that you see here on the right is the Shearwater platform. Um, the, there's two platforms, I'll return to the detail. There's also a drilling rig in the background on this photo. You can see the drilling derrick and a rig support vessel in the foreground. So, to begin with some introductions, I'd like to start with some background information on the Shearwater field itself and the facilities that are present over the field. Shearwater is located in the central North Sea, at the yellow dot, about 250 kilometres due east of Aberdeen. It's in a water depth of about 90 metres. Shell operates the Shearwater field on behalf of its partners, SO Exploration and Production and BP. The map on the right shows shearwater in the context of the facilities that it uses in the central North Sea. This is fixed infrastructure and shearwater is fairly host <laughs> by this pipeline. It's unique in that all the processing of that gas to get it to grid quality happens on the platform and so there's no processing facilities in Norfolk. The gas simply goes straight into the pipeline which appears out of your cooker or into your boiler. Condensate is exported to the north via a number of intermediate facilities on shore up at St Fergus, which is north of Aberdeen. Production from Shearwater started in September 2000 and it continues today. To give you some idea of what the field's capable of, at its peak, a day's production from Shearwater would fuel a family car for 1,690 years or heat the water for four and a half million showers. For the engineers among you, I want to spend some time looking at the facilities. As I said, there's two platforms. One in this diagram shown here houses the facilities, and the other houses the wellheads. The two platforms are bridge linked by this 80 metre long structure. As you can imagine, an offshore platform is built in a modular fashion. The lower part steel structure is called the jacket, and the top sides are placed upon it. And as you can see from the data here, there's a significant weight um, of material on both the top sides, although the facilities is by far the largest. When full, that can occupy 78 men and women who live offshore for up to two weeks at a time. When shearwaters are working, uh, it requires 20 megawatts of power um, to tick over. So I've referred to shearwater as being high pressure, high temperature. And these extreme conditions are the result of the shearwater reservoir being very deep. But I wanted to quantify in a way that was hopefully meaningful just how deep we're talking. So the wells on shearwater penetrate 17 to 18,000 feet below the present day seabed. So I'm assuming you're all familiar with the shard. I'm not because I live in Aberdeen. But the shard <laughs> is 1,000 feet tall. If you stack 17 of them, one on top of the other, then that's the kind of depth that we're talking about to get to the shearwater reservoirs. 
And the image on the left shows that pictorial. The image is a seismic line, which I'll refer to, the different colours of the different rock formations. Um, but here are 17 shards stacked, and here are the Shearwater Wells, the lines shown in black. So how does this depth compare to other deep things? Well, the deepest London underground tunnel happens to be near Hampstead, and that's 221 feet deep, not very deep. The deepest water well in the world is in Montana, and that's 7,000 feet, feet deep. So still, compared to Shearwater, not very deep. We run out of wells at that point, and we go to canyons, and the deepest canyon in the world is 11,000 feet deep. So I hope you've got the message that Shearwater is deep. <laughs> in addition to the depth challenge associated with drilling these Shearwater wells, there's also a significant horizontal step out from the platform. So what you see here is the map of London. Um, Burlington House is here. The Thames comes through the bottom. And what I've done here is shown you in plan view by these red lines where the Shearwater Wells go once they leave the platform. So a, a Shearwater Well drilled from Burlington House would get you to the London Business School, Kensington Gardens, or Pimlico Station. Deviating from the vertical also increases the drilled or measured depth of the well. And if we were to take our longest well on Shearwater and lay it out, it's six kilometres long. So it's equivalent to drilling a well from here to Bethnal Green. So I've talked about the Shearwater field being high pressure and high temperature. And the UK government has a very strict definition for use of the term. And that's that it must, a high pressure, high temperature field must have a pressure greater than 10,000 psi and a temperature greater than 150 degrees C. It's the extreme depth of shear water that gives these high pressure, high temperature conditions. As you go down in the earth, the pressure increases because you've got a bigger and bigger column of rock on top of you. The earth's internal heat comes from a combination of residual heat from planetary accretion when the earth was formed and from heat produced through radioactive decay. <coughs> in contrast to high pressure, high temperature, which I'm going to talk about, the UK government also defines extreme high pressure, high temperature wells and ultra high pressure, high temperature wells. So the main reservoir at Shearwater has a temperature of 180 degrees C and a pressure of 15,000 psi. To put that in context, 180 degrees C is the temperature that most people would bake things in their oven at home. And 15,000 psi, perhaps more difficult to visualise, is the equivalent of three elephants standing on a postage stamp. <laughs> would be quite difficult to achieve. So high pressure, high temperature is not a unique phenomenon to the UK Central North Sea. This map from Halliburton shows the location of high pressure, high temperature provinces around the world. So we're in here in the Central North Sea. There's also high pressure, high temperature offshore island. Some of you may be familiar with the Gulf of Mexico and distributed right through uh, the world from Alaska through the Far East to onshore in Australia. This high pressure, high temperature environment gives us many and varied challenges associated with drilling, producing, and importantly, safely abandoning wells in the environment. It's very difficult to keep a borehole open while drilling at significant depth. And in addition, the delicate electronics, which we put down a hole to monitor drilling and beam data back to surface, don't work easily at 180 degrees C. Imagine putting your smartphone in your domestic oven at 180 degrees C for an excess of 24 hours and then expecting it to work, let alone send data back up 17,000 feet to surface. In addition to those challenges, high pressure, high temperature reservoirs are often complex geology. That means it's necessary to design complex wells with multiple inclinations, a lot of steering, and maybe targeting numerous places in the reservoir. The error bars on measurement of common gas minor components, such as hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide, is also very difficult in the high pressure and high temperature environment. It's of utmost importance, though, to quantify these minor gas components in order to correctly design the wells and the facilities and to ensure safe operation um, of the field once it's under production. Pressure prediction is another aspect that's difficult in the high pressure and high temperature environment. The pressure response of a field to production is very difficult to model in any environment, but it's particularly important in the high pressure, high temperature environment, as the gradient of, of pressure decline once you start producing uh, is particularly steep. Integration with geomechanics, that's the study of how 
how the, the rocks behave over time from an early stage is crucial to understand the strength of the reservoir. <coughs> And importantly, the overburden, not just the reservoir rocks, and the likely impact of production on the strength of the producing well. Development planning. So, so, so I'll touch on ways in which an understanding of the geology can help us uh, overcome the, uh, the challenges that I've just outlined. But before I do that, for the engineers among you, I wanted to show you an engineering solution. So what you see here on the right-hand side is an example of the world's first 15,000 PSI rated Christmas tree. It might look, not look like a Christmas tree that you're familiar with, but in the industry we call a Christmas tree the assembly of valves, spools and fittings, which goes on any kind of well, and essentially is the mechanism through which things are produced and control of the well is maintained. If you haven't noticed, this is a regular sized man, not a dwarf. Uh, we're talking about significant engineering here in order to safely operate these wells. But enough of the engineering, let's get on to the geology. So the geology of Shearwater has to start with the geology of the North Sea. The North Sea is an extensional basin which was pulled apart in an east-west direction in the late Jurassic. So that's about 160 million years ago. The Atlantic Ocean is also an extensional basin, and their extension broke the crust apart and led to the formation of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the chain of volcanoes that goes from Iceland down through Hawaii into the South Atlantic, along which new ocean crust is made. While the North Sea never made it to the stage of new oceanic crust, and hence we call it a failed rift basin. The extension was enough, though, to cause large cracks or faults, and the thinning of the crust led to subsidence which gave space for a big pile of sediments to be deposited. The picture top right is an image of what the seafloor would have looked like at the end of the late Jurassic Rift episode. Warm colours are topographic highs and cool colours are topographic lows. Where you see a sharp colour contrast, they're the faults, where the crust has broken apart. Shearwater's located at the red dot, right in the deepest part of the west central garden. The cross section below shows some data on the top and an interpretation on the bottom. And it shows nicely how the rocks can be divided into three that are related temporally to the rift episode. So pre-rift rocks are those that were there before the onset of the extension and they're the ones that have these big faults breaking them up. Thin rift rocks were deposited during the extensional episode. They tend to be wedge shaped uh, and they sit in the middle and post-rift deposits are those that fill the basin in a fairly passive manner after the extension has stopped and they're seen as this big steer's head as we call it sitting in the middle of the basin. I'll now focus in more detail on the structure of the shear water field which sits in a tilted fault block in a position somewhere near this part of the section. So as I said, the shearwater field is situated in a tilted fault block, which is elongated northwest southeast. The map on the left shows shearwater. It also shows the sh a shearwater satellite northwest block, which I'll return to later in the talk. And it also shows some of the neighbouring fields near shearwater. The schematic cross section uh, that you see top right is orientated from southwest to northeast, and it's a line taken right the way through the middle of the shearwater field. The section shows really nicely how the pre-rift stratigraphy, that's the yellow and blue here, have been offset along this fault by the extension in the central North sea. It's that offset which sets up a structural trap up in here against which hydrocarbons can be trapped. The three-dimensional image in the bottom right again shows the shearwater fault block. Again, warm colours are highs, cool colours are lows. And you can see that the Shearwater Fault Block stands proud of any of the structures in the, in the region. And it's this that makes it, as I said, a suitable trap for upward migrating hydrocarbons, which were derived from the prolific Kimmeridge clay formation, uh, which is essentially found all around the Shearwater Block. So the main Shearwater field was discovered in 1988 in the Blue Horizon, which is the Fulmar Formation. 
And seven development wells were put into that formation to produce the hydrocarbons from the unit between 1998 and 2003. However, that unit is not the only reservoir on the Shearwater field. And I'll now step through with you from bottom to top, up through this stack, looking at the geology and the hydrocarbon potential associated with each level. So that diagram is going to go with us. Um, and I'll, I'll use it to keep you right in terms of where we are within the geology. So hydrocarbon potential exists on Shearwater in the Triassic Skagorak Formation, which is the lowermost of the orange horizons. And also seen here is this sandy unit uh, within this representative stratigraphic column from the Central North Sea. There's also hydrocarbons in the Pentland Formation, the upper orange unit in here, uh, and again the sands in here. There's hydrocarbons in the Fulmar, the blue, as I've discussed, in the Sinrift Heather Formation. And then there's also hydrocarbons in the chalk. So for each reservoir interval, I'll first show you either a modern or ancient analogue, some real rocks, and then a summary slide of what the hydrocarbon potential is and where it is in the development history. So the Triassic Reservoir at Shearwater is the Skagorak Formation. The Skagorak was deposited in a dryland fluvial or playa, so rivers and lakes environment, at much like we think <coughs> the lake air basin in Australia is today. And that's the picture that you're seeing here, a photograph taken from an aeroplane looking down on the lake air basin. The two core insects, the two insect photographs are core, taken from the Skagorak formation in the central North Sea, and they show the contrast in reservoir potential depending on where you are in this complex uh, lake and river system. So the top left shows a core which would be representative of drilling in a sandy channel axis. And the bottom right shows a core that would be characteristic of maybe drilling in an overbank setting or in one of the playa lakes. The importance of this contrast um, is seen wherever you see the Skagorak formation in the central North Sea. It's a highly layered unit with alternating layers of sands and shales. The shales are very laterally continuous, and that results in them being barriers to fluid flow. So the Triassic block underneath the Shearwater platform is it within the tilted fault block, as I've shown you, and is yet unpenetrated by a well. It is therefore an exploration target. The structure at the top of the Triassic is shown on this map. Again, warm colours are topographically high and cool colours are low. And you can see this, it's a triangular shaped reservoir with a structural culmination up to the northeast. Although not penetrated in the Shearwater block, the Skagorak formation is penetrated in many neighbouring structures in the central North Sea. And this is an interpreted log from the egret field, which shall operate to the northwest of Shearwater. Again, you see the very highly layered nature. The yellow colours are sands, and the browner colours are more muddy units. And this very highly layered structure is characteristic uh, of the Skagorak formation. Moving up through the stratigraphy, the next reservoir is the Middle Jurassic Pentland Formation. The paleo environment that this was deposited in is different. This is a subhumid alluvial system, and the, this time we're seeing an ancient analogue where the Pentland Formation is preserved in a cliff on the eastern coast of Yorkshire. Again, you see a very highly layered uh, set of stratigraphy with sands and interbedded shales. But here you also see some lateral variation, and there's a channel sand uh, sitting in here. The core uh, is also taken from near to Shearwater, as with the last two cores. And again, you can see different layers. And as with the Skagorak, some of these layers are impermeable shales and therefore act as a barrier to fluid flow. So the Pentland Formation on Shearwater, on Shearwater, unlike the Triassic, has been penetrated by three wells. It's divided into an upper, middle and lower unit. The middle and lower units on Shearwater only have one partial well penetration. <coughs> and there has been production to date only from the upper part of the Pentland Formation. So there's still a great deal of uncertainty associated with the Pentland Formation under the Shearwater field. The Pentland Formation sits directly above the Trass Triassic in the Tilted Fault Block, and as such, the top structure map is very similar with a crest to the northeast 
and dipping away down uh, to a low point in the southwest. For both the Triassic and the Pentland formations, when designing wells to look for reservoir, this highly, highly layered nature means it's very important to design wells that cross-cut the stratigraphy. That is to go into as many layers as possible to sample the fluid fill uh, in as many of those layers as you can. Detailed geological knowledge and the use of analogues, such as I've shown you, is necessary in order to understand the reservoir and thus explore and produce from such reservoirs. Moving up through the stratigraphy again, there are two reservoir sandstone formations in the upper Jurassic, and the first is the Fulmar formation. The Fulmar is a shallow marine sandstone deposited in the high energy environment located close to shore. The Fulmar and shear water is comprised almost entirely of sand, as shown in the core photograph here, which is taken from the shear water field. The sandstone is very well mixed, it shows very little structure. And that's because this high energy environment close to shore is a very optimal place to live if you're a small organism. And they burrow and mix the sand up. It was the discovery of hydrocarbons in the Fulmar which led to the development of the shearwater field. You'll recall that the, the Fulmar is the blue horizon in here. And it's the youngest formation in the tilted fault block. And therefore it's the unit into which hydrocarbons have, most hydrocarbons have migrated, being structurally highest. That, combined with that excellent reservoir quality I just showed you, makes the reservoir a prolific resource. The Fulmar formation was originally developed with a number of wells, and at the time was one of the first high-pressure, high-temperature developments to come on stream in the Central North Sea when it came on stream in September 2000. This is the top structure map for the Fulmar, and as you can see, it's compartmentalised at its crest by a series of east-west running faults. These divide the reservoir into three main blocks, and wells had to be placed into each of these blocks during the early compartment, during the early development, in order to effectively drain the field. Pressure depletion of the Fulmar Reservoir on Shearwater has resulted in all of the production wells failing before the reservoir has been totally drained. And current work on Shearwater is focusing on reinstating these production wells because we believe there's still a significant resource left in the Fulmar formation. Moving up through the stratigraphy again, the next reservoir unit is the heather sand. The heather sand is something completely different. It's a deep water sandstone body, which is located in what we traditionally consider in the North Sea to be a shale prone heather formation. The heather sand is thought to have been deposited from gravity flows, which were derived from the uplifting crest of the fault blocks during the late Jurassic extension. So these sands were derived very locally, maybe some of them even from the Fulmar, that great quality reservoir that I just showed you on the previous slide. The header sand is a series of isolated, let's go back, the header sand is a series of isolated sand bodies sitting within a shaley background unit. And this photo shows an, an ancient analogue from the Grey Dano formation in the south of France. Again, a standard size person for scale. And you can see Sand bodies, which are weathering proud because they're harder with sharp bases and sharp tops, interbedded with more shaly units. So the heather sand was a surprise whilst drilling on Shearwater, as it was found unexpectedly uh, in a number of the early Fulmar wells, because it's below the resolution of the data that we use to plan the wells. It's just 50 foot thick um, and would sit somewhere in the middle of this unit, but is essentially invisible. A top structure map of the heather formation is simply computed by taking an isopack down from the top heather formation and relying on well correlation panels to know the relative thicknesses of the unit. The heather sand is hydrocarbon bearing at the crest of the field. It was initially produced purely to reduce the pressure in the heather in order to allow the redrilling of some of the Fulmar wells. However, the, the production from the heather uh, was, were higher than expected, and they now justify a standalone well, optimally located to drain as much of this unit as possible. The final unit I'm going to talk to you about is the Cretaceous Chalk Group. The Cretaceous Chalk was deposited after cessation of extension in the Central North Sea and comprises the skeletons of microscopic sea creatures. The chalk is a predominantly deep water deposit, which is traditionally considered to be homogeneous. 
But then in core, such as the core you see here from near shear water, you can see a significant degree of heterogeneity. The chalk present around the UK and, and France, at the coast of the UK and the north coast of France varies considerably. And we consider the best analogue for shear water to be this section, which is near Flamborough Head in Yorkshire. The chalk group is present over the entirety of shear water at a fairly uniform thickness. It was deposited as the basin subsided after the cessation of extension. The correlation panel shows fairly tram line lines, indicating that the unit really doesn't change in thickness as you go across the basin. The top, top, top structure map looks completely different to anything we've seen before. And the chalk is present as domes and troughs that are fairly at low relief throughout the region. There is a dome located over the shearwater field in here, as can be seen from this seismic line, which is orientated southwest to northeast. This is the chalk section. The chalk's traditionally been considered part of the overburden and was only of interest as it had to be safely drilled through. However, gas shows while drilling and increased productivity of the chalk formation both at Shearwater and elsewhere in the central North Sea with production of the underlying Fulmar formation means the chalk may also present an opportunity. However, both that increased production and the mechanical modification of the chalk group that has caused it also represent a hazard to drilling that must be well understood. And in the next part of my talk, I want to look at how 4D seismic data and geomechanical modelling can both play a significant role in understanding the chalk and then show you some drilling technologies that allow us to access the hydrocarbons below the chalk. So, as I say, I want to focus on how Shell are using a range of technologies to unlock the high pressure, high temperature play. There's no doubt that the operations that we undertake in the Central North Sea today wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. And as technology advances, we learn an increasing amount about the subsurface and therefore can design and execute wells more safely and with more precision than ever before. So the first example I'd like to use is that of seismic data, specifically how the use of 4D seismic data has increased our understanding of the changes of rock properties in the reservoir, but also above and below the reservoir at Shearwater. For those that are not familiar, I'll first explain what seismic data is and how it's acquired. So the inset picture shows a seismic acquisition vessel. The seismic acquisition vessel tows an array of air guns, which produce sound waves, which go down through the water column and into the rock. The sound waves bounce back off various layers in the earth to the surface where they're detected by hydrophones, which are also towed by the seismic acquisition ship. Complex algorithms then process the time and nature of the waves that are reflected back, and they give a picture of what the layers look like in the earth. In order for this data to work, what you need is a contrast in rock properties at an interface, such as where a sandstone meets a mudstone or a limestone. So the data in the picture is one that you've seen before. It's a section through the tilted fault block that is shear water, orientated from southwest to northeast. Seismic data comes in various forms. It may be 2D, simply acquired by sailing a ship in, along a single line. It may be 3D, acquired by sailing a ship backwards and forwards in a given area to produce a cube of data, or it may be 4D. And 4D seismic is the difference between a baseline 3D survey and a repeat or time-lapse 3D seismic survey. The difference is that you get a manifest as time shifts. That is, a change in the time the seismic wave takes to get down to a surface and back again. And that change occurs as a result of changes in the rock properties or the, the fluid fill, where maybe water is replacing oil or gas, as a result of production. So a 4D image over the shear water field. Production from a shear water, uh, production from a field such as shear water decreases the pressure. That in turn increases the effective stress and it causes the reservoir to compact as the grains physically get closer together. That compaction causes an increase in the velocity that the sound waves can travel through the rock and therefore the sound waves from the seismic acquisition ship get back up to the surface quicker than they did before. So on the seismic image that you see here, time shifts are shown by the colours, with the maximum time shifts being red. So the maximum time shifts on the shearwater field are recurring down here, which is the Fulmar Reservoir. But there's also significant time shifts going up into the overburden, particularly up through the chalk group. So there's modification not going on, not just to the rocks in the reservoir, but also to those rocks in the overburden. 
compaction in the reservoir must be taken up by the rocks in the overburden expanding. Because if not, we have a space problem. That leads to the concept of stress arching. So I've said that the reservoir compacts, and that means that in the immediate overburden, there is expansion. That allows fractures, both horizontal and vertical fractures, to open. However, that compaction in the reservoir, which leads to expansion in the immediate overburden, also then, through the process of stress arching, leads to compression in the overburden even higher up. That in turn opens horizontal fractures, less than lower down, and tends to close vertical fractures. So production at depth is having a profound impact on the rock properties at different layers as you go up through the overburden. The 4D data can also be seen in map view. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. So this is the 4D seismic acquired in 2002, subtracted from a baseline survey which was acquired pre-production. The slide's very noisy, and that's the nature of seismic data. <coughs> There's an inherent level of noise associated with any seismic survey. The shear water field is basically delineated by the red polygon here. And um, blue colours are bigger time shifts uh, than, than red colours. And this map shows us two important things. The first is that I mentioned earlier on that there were faults that were compartmentalizing this reservoir. The uniform blue color across the entirety of the reservoir indicates that the whole reservoir is being drained. So we are effectively producing hydrocarbons from each of the fault blocks. I also ask you to bear in mind that shear water northwest block. Northwest block sits in here. At the time of acquisition of this seismic data, northwest block had not been drilled. This seismic data allowed us to predict that that northwest block would be at virgin pressure, which was important for the safe planning and then execution of a well, which was drilled in 2004 and indeed found to be at virgin pressure. Taking the learnings from 4D and a 3D model of the reservoir, which is built by the geologist from 3D seismic data and from well bore data, it's possible to build a geomechanical model of the shearwater field. The geomechanical model predicts the rock response to production and is calibrated using the 4D seismic that I've shown you. So the image on the right here is a reminder of what's going on with our stress arching. And the image on the left shows a section orientated southwest to northeast uh, across the field. The different colors are the different formations, which now hopefully you're familiar with. Each formation has a different mechanical behavior depending on the rock that it's comprised of. And so it therefore must be modelled as a discrete unit within the geomechanical model. In addition to the observations that we can make from seismic data, we can also make observations on a much finer scale from field analogues. I showed you earlier on a photograph taken at Flamborough Head. These are two more photographs taken at Flamborough Head showing you more detail in the rocks. What we're seeing here is a series of conjugate fractures, that is fractures at angles to one another, located within a discrete unit. This is a zoom in on one of those sets of conjugate fractures. As a result of observations of these conjugate fracture panes bound within certain layers in the chalk at Flamborough Head, a layer of conjugate fractures was put into the geomechanical model in order to try and replicate data that we'd seen, or an effect that we'd seen in the 4D seismic data. The layer of fractures causes a localized increase in vertical strain, as you can see from this result. There's the layer of fractures, and there's the depleting fulmar reservoir. That can also be compared with the slowdown in seismic velocities that we saw on the 4D data. Interestingly, the geomechanical modeling also shows a concentration of shear stresses on the flanks of the shear water field. So again, a southwest-northeast line, bright colors, a higher shear stresses. The geomechanical model tells us that the safest place to plan infill wells is right down the middle of the field at the crest, as the higher shear strain regions, which will be harder to drill in, are located on both of the flanks. So having done all that subsurface work, we, ha we have a good understanding of what we think is going on in the shear water field. But in order to actually produce those hydrocarbons, it's necessary to design both safe and drillable wells. In my final few slides, I'm going to show you three examples of technology that's helping us drill in the high-pressure, high-temperature environment. But before describing those technologies, for those not familiar with how we drill wells, 
I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of the process of drilling a well. So a well is drilled in sections, which have decreasing diameter as you go down into the ground. Each section is drilled by a drill bit, such as you see here, which is mounted on drill pipe. Once the, the whole section is drilled, the drill pipe and drill bit are removed from the hole. The hole is lined with a steel casing or liner and then cemented into place. While drilling, the pipe here and the hole or the annulus are filled with drilling mud. The drilling mud has three roles. It keeps the bit cool, it lubricates the bit, and it brings the rock cuttings that the bit is uh, creating back up the surface through a circulating system. And it's that circulating system that you see top right. The circulating mud also exerts a pressure on the sides of the drilled hole, and that stops it collapsing back in on itself. Certain components of the mud also permeate into the rock, and they form what's called filter cake. And that filter cake acts as a barrier around the well bore, stopping any more of the drilling mud going into the formation being drilled. I'll now show you the three of the technologies which are, we are using to drill on shear water. The first of these is a system called managed pressure, pressure drilling. This system allows the mud present in the borehole while drilling to be part of a totally closed system. And therefore, the pressure of the mud in the drill pipe and the annulus can be monitored and controlled at all times. The graph on the right shows pressure on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis. It shows how theoretically the fracture gradient in red and the pore pressure gradient in blue increase as you go down in the earth. When drilling a well of any kind, it's important to keep the pressure in the hole in between the fracture gradient and the pore pressure gradient. Going above the fracture gradient will cause the rock to fracture and may result in the loss, loss of drilling fluid into those fractures. Going below the pore pressure gradient will allow the fluids that are naturally present in the rock, be that water, oil or gas, to flow into the well, and you, again you may lose control of the well. The space between the pore pressure gradient and the fracture gradient is therefore the drilling window. In this theoretical example, the drilling window is wide, and in principle it's very easy to keep your drilling mud at the pressure within the drilling window. However, when drilling in a depleted high pressure, high temperature environment, these gradients no longer apply and the drilling window is considerably narrowed. So having the ability via managed pressure drilling to accurately control the pressure of the mud in the annulus allows drilling much more safely in much, much smaller drilling windows and in places where the drilling window is estimated to be almost absent. The second example I want to show you is drill and liner technology. So I've described the conventional approach to drilling and lining wells. Drill the hole, take the drill bit out, and then line the hole. That's great if you can take your drill bit out and your hole doesn't collapse. However, again, when drilling in depleted high-pressure, high-temperature reservoir, you, you, you can potentially have a problem as the mud weight and pressure needed to keep your overburden open is enough to fracture your depleted reservoir. This technology mitigates against that by essentially lining the hole as it is drilled. It effectively means that no part of the formation is ever left open. It prevents hole collapse and often allows for the reservoir section to be drilled when it otherwise wouldn't be. Finally, I'd like to show you the use of wellbore strengthening. So as I previously showed you, fracture strength is important and is reduced in a depleted reservoir such as shear water. So when drilling back into the reservoir, we run the risk that we fracture the reservoir and that can lead to fluid losses and possible loss of well control. So the image that you're seeing here shows the well bore as a circle. We're now looking down the well bore and we're seeing fractures that come off the well bore. When those fractures open, drilling mud will go into them. The use of well bore strengthening, a well bore strengthening system comprises putting particles such as graphite or ground carbonate into the mud that essentially act as a plug to plug off the fractures. So the early mud that goes into the fracture with the propent is lost to the formation, but once that plug is in place, no further mud is lost. It's essentially a sophisticated way of building a filter cake around the well bore to prevent fluid loss. It allows the higher compressive stress to be maintained at the well bore and therefore effectively is increasing that fracture strength back to that theoretic, towards that theoretical curve that we saw on the last slide. 
So I hope I've shown you, by understanding the geology and by using a range of technologies, that Shell is working to understand and produce hydrocarbon safely from the high pressure, high temperature environment. There's no question that the UK demand for energy in the 21st century is driving us into more and more difficult environments. And she was just one example of how the challenging high pressure, high temperature environment can be overcome. I should say that high pressure, high temperature is still new for many companies. And Shell are one of the more experienced operators in the Central North Sea. As I said, the Shearwater field was the first high pressure, high temperature field to come on stream. Depletion of these high pressure, high temperature fields is revealing new challenges. And technology needs to keep up with those challenges in order to keep these fields producing. So high pressure, high temperature development requires innovative thinking and use of new technologies to secure the energy supply for the UK in the future. I'd finally like to thank our partners, ESSO Exploration and Production and BP, for their permission to present this talk and to show you all the technical material that I have this evening. Thank you very much for listening. Well, I'm sure I'll think of that next time we fill the tank of our car. It's not quite as simple. Absolutely fascinating talk. I'm sure there's some questions there. Would you please wait for the microphone to arrive? I think it's been brought in. I don't see one in. But uh, get your questions ready, please. Who wants to start when we actually have got a microphone? Right? It's on its way. Down here, please. Um, Ray Hobbs, I'm a geotechnical engineer working offshore. Um, is there any evidence at the site of uh, C4 subsidence? Um, obviously, the extreme example of that is Equifix. I'm not expecting you to say there's that much, but uh, which was eight meters or something, is it? But uh, have you seen any settlements of the platform as a result of uh, all platforms as a result of uh, reservoir depletion? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, Equifix is the extreme example, and um, for those that are not aware. Ecofisk is a chalk field, um, which through production has subsided so much that they've had to jack the platform back up to stop it going below storm wave base. Um, Shearwater is indeed subsiding. It's monitored continuously using a, a GPS system. Um, but no, and it was always designed to allow for that subsidence. So it sits high enough above wave base um, for the predicted subsidence over the entire life of the field. Um, so yeah, it's a, but it's a much smaller scale, as you say, than that that you see on Ecofisk. Who's next? Right down at the front here. Yeah, Hold on. We have to capture your uh, immortality. Uh, Arthur Dacre, I'm a drilling engineer. Um, just wanted to ask you whereabouts in the what formations you're actually seeing that arching effect, because I was quite aware of the compaction and the extension, but I didn't realize it was actually closing up for the vertical fractures shower. Yeah, so. Um, as you saw from the diagram, that, that 4D seismic signal, which is giving us the hard data calibration um, to the arching, um, extends right up to nearly the top chalk formation. So it's all within the chalk is where you're actually seeing that, well, rather than in the Paleocene? Yes. So there's not, it's not just the chalk. There's, there's other formations in between the reservoir um, that I didn't talk about because they don't have reservoir potential. Um, but yeah, I'm not aware of anything up into the Paleocene. Okay. Great. Thank you. Somebody else for the question out there? Okay. You talked about the need for um, 20 megawatts of power. Uh, do you, I mean, you've obviously got a lot of uh, hot fluids. So is there a possibility of generating it geothermally, or do you just use the hydrocarbons that have, you have plenty of, I assume? <laughs> as, you know, I, I'm not an expert on these facilities by any, by any means. As far as I'm aware, um, it, it's the hydrocarbons, it's the gas um, that is used as a fuel source on the platform. There, we've got two. One and another. Hi there, uh, controversial one. Shale gas, will it constrain future developments of this type, do you believe, in the next decade or two? I'm afraid it's a controversial question which I am in no way qualified to answer. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am a geologist who works conventional hydrocarbon resources. So, uh, yeah. It's one that 
we can take offline, but not one for me to answer, I'm afraid. My career is very much in the offshore environment around the UK, where shale gas is not. <laughs> right. Well, there even controversy at the door. Look at that <coughs> You mentioned um, abandonment and um, sort of the end of life very briefly, but what, what really is the major challenge in hyper or the major difference between um, HPHT reservoirs and um, you know, lower pressure, lower temperature? I mean, what, what, what are the major differences? Yeah, so, so for those not aware, the the life cycle of a well begins with when that well is first drilled, either as an exploration and appraisal or as a development well. It obviously then has a production life, cy life cycle. Um, and then we have an obligation, as does any operator, to leave that well totally safe at the end of its uh, useful life. And that's essentially the abandonment. Um, and that's, that's the same, you know, irrelevant of whether you're in the normally pressured, normally temperatured environment, whether you're onshore or offshore, um, or whether you're in the high pressure, high temperature environment. Specifically for shearwater, um, I mentioned that the shearwater fulmar wells, some of them have failed. Um, and they failed because of the pressure depletion and because of the changes in the rock properties. Um, and that's made them a special case to abandon. Uh, Shell's been working over the last few years very closely with the UK government and with the other HPHT operators to safely and effectively abandon these high pressure, high temperature wells, uh, which are, have, as I say, have failed. They're not just standard abandonments. That's what makes them special. Anybody else? I'm very quiet on this side. <laughs> I think we're in my, oh, we're not. <laughs> it's just a very basic question. When you abandon a well, what do you do? Do you put a lid on it or pour some concrete down ask it? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, oh, you can feel free to answer it. <laughs> Two speakers for one. <coughs> Anybody else with a with a question that they? Yeah, um, with the enhanced, uh, with the failing reservoirs, how do you? What, what processes do you go through to enhance oil recovery um, in high temperature and high pressure environments? Uh, when you say failing reservoirs, I, the, the things that have failed are the wells, not the okay. reservoir. Failing wells, yeah. So yeah, so it's as simple as redrilling those wells. Um, a high pressure, high temperature field has a lot of natural drive in it. So there's no, there's no need to do anything in terms of enhancing that oil recovery. So in order to get more of the hydrocarbons out of the ground, it is, I mean, I, I'm going to say it's as simple as, it's obviously not simple to drill a well in a depleted high pressure, high temperature field. But it's in terms of, you know, the actual subsurface understanding, it's as simple as putting those wells back in the ground and getting them back on production again. There's nothing wrong with that reservoir. There's a to the non-engineer, how do you prevent um, blowouts in these high-pressure wells? Is there any modern technology? Well, that's it's exactly the way that I've described you, to you in terms of drilling. So it's a very it's a very careful prediction of the pressures that you're going to encounter, both in the virgin state and then in the depleted state. And then it's a very careful planning and execution of the well to ensure that the the drilling mud, which is a fluid with highly complex chemistry, um, is exactly the right pressure to hold back those fluids that might give you any uh, loss of well control, such as a blowout. And then you showed the blow preventer? Yeah, and then I, sh I showed the, uh, the engineering so that goes on the top for when it does all go wrong. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Last question? Yes. You are last <laughs> Does a shear water use any horizontal drilling at all? It's always intrigued me how they do it. I just wanted to. 
Yeah, so there's, there's no wells on shearwater which are truly horizontal, i.e. 90 degrees from the vertical. But as I showed you in the early slides, the wells are not vertical either. So there's, the wells are, are a variety of inclinations. Um, wells in the Fulmar Reservoir, um, the actual reservoir doesn't really dictate uh, what angle you need to put them in. As I said, with very lead reservoirs such as the Pentland and the Triassic, it's important to cross as many layers as you can so that the angle of the fault block and the position of the platform dictates the angle at which you're going to drill. I should say that the position of the platform relates to this gentleman's question and it's actually look offset from the crest of the field to minimise uh, the compaction, which in turn means that the wells have to be drilled at a different inclination rather than vertical. Change, how do you change the inclination of the... Of the <laughs> Two drilling, <laughs> two drilling technologies um, point the bit and push the bit, and essentially, but essentially you have a steering capability once you have a drill bit in the ground, uh, which by the means of one of two types of motor, you can actually manoeuvre your bit up to an angle, what are we at, five degrees per hundred metres, something like that, to get round corners. So it's controlled from, controlled from the, the vessel that... The well is drilled from via a sophisticated um, set of, let's say, motors down near the bit. Okay, I think at that point we should stop and let uh, Caroline rest her voice. I hope you agree, agree with me. We've had an absolutely fascinating talk, which has involved geology, engineering, and quite literally cutting edge technology. So, would you like to thank Caroline? Uh, some of you may